Uh, are you speaking of family studies? Very proud to present today's speech by Ian Asko. Back in 2014, University of Chicago professor John Mishman, he published a very provocative article in the National Policy. The title is why Americans should abandon Taiwan. And uh, since then, a uh, lot of uh, book and article focus on that particular aspect. In the academia area in the States, it's, it's a reality we have people really use their academic integrity look at the situation in Taiwan. I can count only one or two, maybe Sherry Riggers. She had a uh, uh, Davidson College of North Carolina. She has a book called Why Taiwan Matters. And today we're very happy to have another uh, author of the book, uh, Chinese threat to Taiwan, come to us to make uh, his case about the peace and stability in Taiwan. And Institute of Taiwan Studies is very, very proud to have this kind of association. At this time, we would like to uh, acknowledge the uh, co-sponsor of this event. Of course, this nice facility is provided by Taiwan Center. But I would like to uh, acknowledge the support of Taiwan Center and uh, co upon the, the chairperson of Town Center Foundation, Dr. Simon Lee, if you come forward. I want to take a picture first. Okay, let the picture out. I'll come. And then uh, the Huapa Orange County President, uh, Josephine Yang. <laughs> and the Huapa uh, Area County, Ken Wu. Where's Ken? Ken. <laughs> And we have uh, the Prabhupada president, uh, Peter Chen, with us too today. Where's Peter? Yeah. <laughs> and, and all those uh, co sponsors uh, come forward. We will take a picture first, then we start our program. Thank you. Everybody Thank you, Richard. I want to make a question. I'm the former president. We were new president uh, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very thankful to. Institute for Taiwanese Studies and the leadership for their great work. I first met Ian two years ago. He gave a very great speech at our FAPA banquet. And since that time, a lot of happened in Taiwan Straits, including, of course, the issue with China. Now, uh, Ian has a lot of background. I think the most interesting that he probably speak better Mandarin than I do, because Ian, you got a master's degree from Tsinghua University, right? Mm -hmm. And he's spent maybe about five years in Taiwan. So uh, feel free to ask him in Mandarin or maybe in Taiwanese. Um, currently, Ian is a research fellow at Project 2049 as a research analyst, doing a lot of studies uh, in security and defense in Asia. Um, I want to make sure I don't butcher this, so I'm just reading from the script that I prepared. Ian also worked as a visiting fellow at Japan Institute for International Affairs in Tokyo. Prior to that, he lived in Taipei from 2005 to 2010. And he also worked as a China analyst at the Center for Naval uh, Analysis. So, um, I'm very happy to be here on behalf of FAPA and everybody. We appreciate what Ian has done and what he was here with us today. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, very good afternoon to you all, and thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, it is really a privilege and a pleasure to be here with you all today, and I would like to begin by thanking the Institute for Taiwanese Studies, uh, ITS, and uh, also FAPA, the co-host, uh, for having me. This is my first time in Los Angeles. I've transited the airport 
many times on my way to Taiwan or to other places in Asia. But this is my first time to leave the airport and to actually see the city. And it's wonderful to be able to um, be here and to meet you all and to discuss these issues. Uh, what I'd like to do this afternoon is first talk a little bit about the background to the book, the research, uh, why was this book written in the first place, uh, what was I hoping to achieve by it, uh, and then to discuss what is in the book, what are some of the key takeaways from the research, and then where we might go uh, in the future. And then after that, the most exciting part for me, uh, whenever I'm at any event like this, is the Q&A. That's what I really look forward to, is hearing from you, hearing your thoughts, hearing your reactions. Uh, and if it's not a question, that's OK, right? Um, because I'm, I'm very interested to know how you all see this problem. Uh, as you'll see, I have my own very uh, small, narrow view of it. Uh, but that's just one view. And so I look forward to the discussion uh, afterwards. So just to begin, why was this book written in the first place? What is the background to it? Why write a book on a topic as sensitive as this? Most people in Washington, D.C., most smart people tend to, and I think this is true in any capital city, anywhere in the world, you tend to shy away from controversy, right? If there's a real sensitive issue, and nothing's more sensitive than war and peace, and nothing's more sensitive in war and peace than what at least one side considers an unresolved civil war, right? Why talk about it in the first place? What is it that merits this kind of examination? Uh, because, of course, it has not been a popular topic uh, for a number of reasons for a very long time. Well, in my case, I grew up as, uh, I grew up in rural Illinois. My dad was a state police detective. My mom was a nurse. And so I didn't have an international relations, foreign policy, or military background. But I did have a fascination with military history. Uh, my grandfather was a Marine who fought his way across the Pacific in World War II. And I was just so fascinated by his experience. And so I grew up uh, asking him about what it was like to fight on these islands, uh, to fight across the Pacific. What surprised him? What, what did he remember? Um, and he would always tell these terrible stories, because almost everybody in his battalion was killed. They all started uh, in New Zealand. They all trained together in New Zealand before they landed on Tarawa. And then they went from Tarawa to Saipan to Tinian um, to Guam, and then eventually uh, to Okinawa. And then he was in occupation forces near Nagasaki at Ground Zero. And so most of the guys that he went through the war with uh, didn't make it all the way. He himself just was barely, um, barely survived being shot by a sniper. And so he would tell these terrible stories really awful stories of combat. And he would talk about different battles he was in and different friends he lost. And it was interesting. He would end every story with this final thought. Thank God we never landed on Formosa. Thank God, you know, despite as terrible as all that was, thank God we never had to invade Taiwan. It turns out that his unit, the 2nd Marine Division, was initially assigned to Operation Causeway. From 1943 until 1944, the Pentagon had intended to invade and take over Formosa. Then they studied the problem. They realized in about the summer of 1944 that they didn't have enough guys to do it. The war in Germany was taking too long. The Nazi regime hadn't fallen. And so all the divisions that they were waiting for and expecting in the Pacific had not arrived. And so there was this debate that went on between the Joint Chiefs of Staff and uh, the, the commanders out in the Pacific. What do we do? Do we land on the Philippines, which is, of course is what MacArthur was, was advocating? Do we land in Okinawa? Do we b do both? Do we still land on Taiwan? There's this debate that went on. And ultimately, of course, uh, perhaps thankfully, they decided to forego Taiwan, to leapfrog Taiwan. And so my grandfather landed on Okinawa instead. And that became the intended staging area for what they thought was going to be the, the ultimate invasion of the Japanese home islands. And so from a young age, I was interested in amphibious warfare. 
and island warfare and in Taiwan. What was it about Taiwan that made it such a difficult place to invade? And what was it geostrategically about this island that was so appealing to Pentagon planners in World War II? Because for at least 18 months of the war, this was the central feature of our strategy for the ultimate um, capture of the Japanese home islands. Well, fast forward. Um, so I ended up going through school and uh, studying in China. Uh, I was a study abroad student uh, at Fudan University in Shanghai in 2004. Um, I was a junior in college, and I knew very little about, really at that time, Chinese history, and I knew even less about cross-strait relations. And so I was very surprised one day when I was at the bookstore in Shanghai near campus and there was a full page, the, the cover page article in Newsweek, because they had Newsweek from the United States, which was my favorite reading at the time, about how Chen Shui-bian, President Chen Shui-bian had been shot. And Vice President Annette Liu had been shot in an assassination attempt. This was March 2004. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is, this is a big deal. How could this be? This is, it seems very, like a very important development. This is almost like something you would see in a movie. And why is this not being talked about more on campus or anywhere else? And so I bought the magazine and I took it back to my dorm and I opened it up and I'm flipping through, okay, I looked at the table of contents, page 35 to page 39, this expose of what happened and blow by blow. Well, it was gone. It was gone. I opened it up and those pages had been cut out. I thought, well, this is odd. So I went to a different bookstore. I, first I took it back and got my money back and complained to the bookseller. And then I went to a, a different bookstore. And the same thing happened. And the same thing happened. And so I started to understand that this was a story that was too sensitive for readers, even international readers, in Shanghai. And then it wasn't long after that a classmate of mine, uh, she was a graduate student, we did language exchange, um, and she was part of the welcoming party uh, because I was, this was part of a scholarship program, the Illinois-China Exchange Program, where there were two, two of us that went from the University of Illinois. And she calls me up one day and wanted to have coffee or tea and, and talk, very suddenly. And sure, so we sit down, and the first thing, right out of the bat, do you support Taiwan arms sales? Do you support Taiwan? I thought, well, this is odd. She always seemed, she's been such a nice, friendly person all, all along and never talked politics and never had any, and all of a sudden she was very confrontational and very heated. And I didn't think too much about it. I just said, well, sure I do. Taiwan's a democracy. Why wouldn't the United States sell arms? Why wouldn't we support Taiwan? Taiwan's a democracy. What's the big deal? And she said to me very angrily, well, if you think that way, our two countries are going to go to war one day. There's going to be a war. That's how you feel. And it was very uncomfortable. It was very awkward. And it wasn't long after that wherever I went, because again, this was 2004, Chen Shui-bian had been shot, very controversial elections in Taiwan. And everywhere I went, because I traveled from Shanghai to Beijing to Chongqing out to Xinjiang, all the way to the Sino-Pakistan border, wherever I went, people would come up to me. And they would ask me about Taiwan. People on the train would ask me. People in the park would ask me. I'd be at a museum and somebody would walk up to me and ask me how I felt about Taiwan. Did I support Taiwan? Did I support Taiwanese independence or Taiwan's you know, separatism, splitism? Uh, did I support arms sales to Taiwan? I thought, well, this is really odd. There's clearly something in this cross-strait relationship that has the Chinese very, very sensitive. This just shows you how naive I was. And so then I went back and I graduated school and I ended up going to Taiwan to continue language studies. And I started to, to learn more about cross-strait relations and the history, Taiwan's contemporary history. And as I talk about in the opening uh, pages of the book, there was a, an air raid drill my first couple weeks in Taipei. And it really struck me as pretty remarkable how serious the police and the military police took this uh, air raid drill, how all the streets were shut off and how, how stern the police were and how many, 
just the, the military and the police presence on the streets and how everything was shut down for a half hour and there's air raid sirens blaring and all the buses pull over and all the traffic stops. And so I started to get a sense that this is a very odd situation because of course in my mind, air raid drills didn't belong in the modern world. You know, I grew up in the, in the 90s where it was post, the, the history had ended. The United States had won the Cold War. There was no such thing as countries invading each other anymore with the exception of the US and Iraq. Right? This kind of thing didn't go on anymore. And it just struck me as so odd that here there's this modern democratic country that takes serious the idea that it might suffer a Pearl Harbor style surprise attack and still does these types of air raid drills. And so I started to ask my Taiwanese friends, do you think China really poses a threat to your country? Do you really think there's gonna be a war? You know, I, I, I just couldn't imagine it at that time. And what I found was that people in Taiwan were surprisingly reluctant to talk about it. It was considered something people didn't want to talk about. It was not a polite topic of conversation. It was an awkward com topic of conversation. And when people did talk about it, they would kind of just, it was almost like a dark joke, right? They'd laugh about it and they'd say, well, you know, we better do what the Chinese tell us to do, otherwise they could be invading our shores tomorrow. And there was this sense of defeatism, the sense of pessimism that, that was there that I heard from a lot of people. And other people would, would tell me how they had plans to leave Taiwan. Well, if the Chinese do invade, it's okay because I have family in California or in New Zealand or in England or somewhere else. And, and so we'll just evacuate the way people evacuated from Hong Kong uh, in 1997, a lot of people evacuated from Hong Kong at that time because they were fearful about what it would mean to be part of the PRC. And of course, in this particular scenario, it would be so much more, um, so much more concerning. And so I started to learn, and I started to ask, and I started to wonder about this particular scenario. And I started to think to myself, how can it be that if indeed the most horrific flashpoint on the planet is this flashpoint, the most difficult planning scenario for the US military, or maybe one of its top two or top three, is preparing for a great power war with China over Taiwan, then how can it be that nobody talks about it? How can it be that nobody's written on this? And I would go to the bookstore all the time looking for materials on this scenario and I just couldn't find anything. But there were all these books about cross-strait relations. And I ended up going to National Zhengzhou University and studied cross-strait relations there. And everyone was only too happy to talk about the economic uh, piece that was there, the diplomatic piece that was there. But here's, there's this invasion threat, at least theoretically, and nobody was talking about it. Nobody was writing about it. And so I started to wonder, well, how can this be? Well, in 2010, I moved back to the United States, and after a long uh, vetting process, started working as an entry-level China analyst at the Center for Naval Analysis. And I thought, okay, now, now I'll find out what the real research on this issue is, that surely the U.S. Navy is constantly thinking about this problem, right? And I was amazed how little people talked about it. I would go to conference after conference on the PLA and war games and discussion groups and lunches with other analysts that focus on this problem, the, the, the PLA uh, issue and what it means for U.S. national security. And what I found was that other national security geeks like me were only too happy to talk about a scenario, war with China over the Senkaku Islands the Delu Thai Islands, uh, in the South China Sea, war in space or cyberspace, all these other potential flashpoints. But you would bring up Taiwan, silence. Oh, we can't talk about that. That's too sensitive. And I was amazed at how sensitive people in Washington, D.C. were, even behind closed doors, when this issue came up. 
And so my curiosity grew. And so I talked to more people and I dug into more uh, PLA sources. And what ultimately came about was this book because two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, I was thumbing through these PLA uh, manuals, these uh, internal doctrine books, where different army units at the Nanjing Army Command Academy talk about what the major missions of the PLA ground forces are and what the major missions of you know, the special forces and the army aviation, the helicopter guys, uh, the air cavalry guys, what they are. And I noticed that over half of these books was dedicated to something they called the Joint Island Attack Campaign. I thought, well, what is that? How can, how can this be so important for the PLA that in their field manuals, over half of it is dedicated to this? And so I started to read about it. And sure enough, they're talking about the invasion of Taiwan. And so now that I knew what those key terms meant, and what they were, then I could go up to the Library of Congress and go to other places and plug those in and dig up more of the technical studies that the PLA had done on this particular operation, how they thought about it. And then I could go to Taiwan and look at all the professional journals that m and publishes. Because actually m and it's incredible. There's a very rich uh, database that they offer for free to anybody that you can look at what all the different services and branches write on what they would do in different scenarios. And of course, this is the most pressing scenario. And so then I produced this book. And to be honest, I wasn't sure that anybody would read it. I wasn't sure what the reaction would be. Uh, and I really appreciate you all being at least interested enough to spend a couple hours of your Saturday with me uh, hearing about it. And so let me talk about what some of the key takeaways of uh, this research project were. So the first thing when talking about the potential for a cross-strait war that struck me as an American were, well, first of all, as Shelley Rigger laid out in a beautiful book that she wrote, why does Taiwan matter? And why does Taiwan matter militarily? So from the geostrategic perspective, or just from the big strategy perspective, why does Taiwan matter to the United States uh, in the first place? And why does it matter to China? Why is it such a big, big deal to the Chinese that they'd actually consider doing something uh, as, as aggressive uh, as this? Well, of course, from the United States perspective, there's two sides to why Taiwan matters. There's the principles, you know, it's in our principal interest to support another democracy, right? We have shared values. So that's why Taiwan matters. Taiwan also matters because of its location. Because of the location of Taiwan in the center of East Asia and the Western Pacific as the gateway for those that are into geostrategy of the first island chain, it's the gateway for China into the Pacific Ocean. So it matters from that perspective as well. And Taiwan therefore plays an outsized role, or a role that's uh, much more important than its size and its population would leave some uh, to believe in terms of importance. And certainly from the PLA's perspective, the Chinese military perspective, you would read through their writings on why it's so important that they prepare for the invasion of Taiwan. Why the invasion of Taiwan is the most important war planning scenario that they have. And of course they would talk about the politics. You know, we need to prevent splitism or separatism. We need to be able to unify at all cost. We'd like to do it peacefully, but we'll do it through, you, through force of arms if necessary. They, so there's the political piece, right? The ideological piece for the Chinese Communist Party and its armed wing, the, the PLA. Because in their eyes, the Chinese Civil War never really ended. And so they have to prepare for ending it. But then there's the economic piece, because they look at Taiwan and they see a location 
from which the United States and the Republic of China carried out a very effective embargo on the Chinese, trade embargo on the Chinese economy from the 1950s uh, to the 1960s, and I actually into the 70s as well, especially in Taiwan's case. And so they look at it, and they look at that history, which scarred many strategists in China, because it was such a tough situation that they were in strategically, and they say, well, we better conquer Taiwan, otherwise hostile forces, read the United States, could in the future use Taiwan as a base to blockade us again. Because that was their form of experience in the 50s and 60s. And so that could happen to us again. And so the only way China can become a great power, a superpower, the only way we can feel safe and be safe is if we control Taiwan. So that's another argument that they sometimes use. And then the third argument is just this, the pure military argument. And that's an argument that says, for China to dominate this region, for us to become a regional hegemon, we need Taiwan. We need to turn Taiwan into a giant garrison state, a military base from which we can project power all across East Asia and the Western Pacific. That this is an island that we can use to blockade Japan, for example, in the air and at sea. And once we control Taiwan, then everybody will have to, have to respect us. And so these are all the different rationales that they use. And this drives, ultimately, uh, their war planning for the invasion of Taiwan. So that's the, the background to it. Now, in terms of why this battlefield is unique, what makes it unique? Why is Taiwan so difficult for the Chinese to, to prepare to invade? What are the things that they write about, that they worry about? So they write about what they would do, and I'll speak to that in a few minutes. But before that, there's the question of when they would invade Taiwan, before we talk about how they would invade Taiwan, and why the timing is so important. Well, time is very, very important in war, plan, war planning. War planning is all about timetables. Because in the invasion of Taiwan, the Chinese would have to mobilize huge numbers of troops and aircraft and ships and corporations. They'd have to stockpile, and they would have to move them. Because most of the units that are assigned the invasion of Taiwan are not deployed in Fujian province or the south of Zhejiang province, or the northern corner of, of uh, Guangzhou, or Guangdong, they're a long way away. So they have to mobilize them to fighting strength, and then they have to move them. Well, that takes a long time to do. Meanwhile, there's the weather. So the weather, as many of you know, in the Taiwan Strait, is a very limiting factor for the PLA the weather conditions. So the sea states in the Taiwan Strait, for most of the year, are too rough to push an invading army across. And so they have to take that into account. So from January until March, the waves are just too high. The winds are too strong. And so if you have flat bottom landing ships, they'll, they'll flip over, they'll capsize. In the end of March, the sea states get much better from March until about May. And then you worry about fog. You don't worry about the surface of the water flipping your boats over. You worry about the fog. You worry about ships being lost in the fog, especially in the morning hours, which is when they'd be crossing the strait to have the element of surprise. And then planes and helicopters crashing into each other and ships crashing into each other and sinking. So that's a factor. Well, then, of course, in May, you have the Mayu, the, the plum rains, right? The monsoon rains. Well, that's a factor. In July, the typhoons start. Taiwan gets hit by an average of six typhoons a year. And so then that becomes a factor. And it's not really until the end of September, until from the end of September until the end of October, that they see a window. So there's a window there. 
That's when conditions are good. So there's that window, and then it closes the end of October, early November. Because, again, the winds pick up. And if you've been out to Penghu, that time of year, the winds are really, really strong. They will literally rip trees out of the ground. And that's why the fighter unit that's deployed out to the Penghu from that period of time actually goes back to Jai. Right? They don't stay out there all year long. In the winter months, when the, the squalls are there, they pull back because the conditions are so dangerous. And that's why if from November until March, you want to jump on a, a ferry to go out to Jinmen or to Makong from, say, Kaohsiung, there's a good chance that your ferry could get delayed or get canceled right, because of the weather conditions. And so these are all the things that the, the PLA thinks about and worries about. And so when people look at the invasion of Taiwan, the first thing they think about is the time. What are the time windows from the PLA's perspective there's that window in, in the spring in Mar from March until the end of April. Then they worry about the fog, but they can also hide in the fog, and so there's potential there. And then in the fall. And the rest of the year, it becomes far more difficult. Time is also important because mobilizing forces takes a lot of time. While the Chinese are mobilizing, the United States and Taiwanese intelligence can see them do that. And so one of the chapters of the book is about that, the warning signs of invasion. What are the warning signs? What are the, it's called indications and warning. How might we know in advance, how might we predict that the Chinese are serious about preparing for the invasion of Taiwan? Well, studies that have been conducted on this, and there have been many, many studies conducted on this, those few that I was able to look at uh, suggested that for the first 60 days, so from the moment the chairman of the Central Military Commission or the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party and the Politburo Standing Committee in Beijing, from the moment they decide that we're going to invade Taiwan, for whatever reason that, that, that may be, they give the orders, full mobilization, it takes, there's going to be a window of about 60 days where things are going to start to happen across from Taiwan that are going to make well-educated observers very nervous. Intelligence officers, military officers, national security officials are going to see things happen that are going to make them nervous. Tecro is going to see things happen in terms of diplomatic messaging and the propaganda piece that's going to make them feel uncomfortable. But it won't be clear. For th the estimate is, and again, we're talking about a scenario that's never happened before. We're talking about a war that's never happened before and hopefully never ever will. And so these are just speculations based on uh, very intensive research studies that have gone on on both sides, actually on all three sides, the United States, China, and Taiwan. But the expectation is for about 60 days, you'll have what's called an uh, ambiguous, unclear warning. And then about a month before the invasion, before the war starts, it'll become very, very clear that the weight of evidence will be overwhelming. There'll be so many indicators by that time, it's expected, that it'll become very, very clear that the Chinese are serious about doing this. And all the tensions, all the exercises, all the potential assassination attempts, or the sabotage, or the troop movements, or the mobilization, the stockpiling, the financial chaos that's going on, all these terrible things that are going on because this is going to happen in the midst of a crisis. It's not just going to be a bolt out of the blue. All these things are leading to that nightmare scenario. Well, that's important for the United States because we're so far away. You know, the third fleet is, is just south of here in San Diego. And so that's where the bulk of our warfighting power is. And uh, of course, out in Hawaii, that's over 5,000 miles that, that those ships have to get underway. And the seventh fleet in Tokyo Bay is still 1,300 miles away. So it takes time. And the Air Force as well. So Air Force squadrons across the continental United States, and, well, really across the world, then have to start moving into position. And in Taiwan, it's even more vital because troops have to be mobilized. They have to be brought up 
to high levels of readiness. And that takes a presidential order, right? And so all these classified procedures are in place for the president and the executive UN, the premier, and the speaker of the LY, the legislative UN, in that situation, that scenario, to come together and to have a war council to make the decision based on the best intelligence they have on when the invasion can be expected. And at that point, then they can start to, to mobilize, to prepare the country for war. Because so many things have to happen to get ready for that eventuality, and you never, ever, ever want to get it wrong. Because it would be devastating for Taiwan to mobilize, to declare a state of emergency, really to declare martial law is what it would look like, temporarily, and then not to have the Chinese actually attack. That would completely demoralize, and not only would it, it paralyze the economy and paralyze international uh, chains of goods and services, but it would have a, a tremendous negative effect on people's confidence in their government. And so it's a very difficult question of when do you call it? How do you do that? How do you prepare for this? And so this is what one of the chapters of the book talks about. Now let me talk a little bit, uh, if we could go to the next slide, let me talk a little bit about what China's war plan for the invasion of Taiwan looks like, what are some of the obstacles that they face, what are the things that they worry about, and then what is Taiwan's own defense plan looks like for this scenario. Um, so just a primer on the joint island attack campaign. So when you read PLA writings on the invasion of Taiwan, the first thing that they talk about is the vital importance of what they call information control, air control, and sea control. So for anything else to be possible in their war plan, because army units are very vulnerable to being attacked from the air, right? And they're very, very vulnerable when they're on ships moving across the Taiwan Strait. So for anything to be possible for them, for this scenario, this operation, to be realistic, they have to have complete control over the electromagnetic spectrum, the air, and the sea, at least for the right window of time. And so this is something they talk a lot of. So the first stage of, of this operation would be what, what they call a blockade and bombardment operation. So that would be several days where they would be executing a blockade and a bombardment of Taiwan. And this would be cyber attacks. This would be electronic warfare attacks. This would be submarines mining the major port facilities. This would be ballistic missiles and cruise missiles and UAVs attacking the air bases and the command and control centers, the presidential office, or wherever the president of Taiwan was. Because again, the leadership is everything in this scenario. Leadership is essential. And the protection of the leadership, not only the president and her, her cabinet members and top advisors, but also the general staff department, those generals that are going to execute this war plan, uh, and then the commanders of the army divisions and the naval flotillas, uh, the, air, the air wings, keeping those guys safe is essential because the Chinese have made very clear in their writings that the first thing that they're going to try to do is to assassinate all these top decision makers, to cut the head off. They call it decapitation operations, right? To paralyze the system. Because as long as Taiwan has a brain that's directing all the muscles to move, the Taiwanese military, at least from the PLA's perspective, is a big threat to them. And it could potentially be very devastating, especially from the army's perspective, from the, the Chinese ground force perspective. So they have to be able to do decapitation. If they can't do that, then everything becomes very difficult. And they have to have control over all information, be able to black out Taiwan, to knock out the power, cut off communications. Well, if all of that works, and it could take several days, in fact, it could take several weeks or even months, depending on the pace that they choose, the intensity level that they choose, then the next stage in their war plan, um, as far as we can tell, is the amphibious landings. So that's actually loading the front line units aboard ships and aboard helicopters and the airborne units, the paratroopers aboard planes, 
pushing them across the Taiwan Strait for surprise attacks on Taiwan's beaches. And then being able to land on Taiwanese beaches and at ports and on airstrips. This is something that in the book I describe as the transportation trinity. Because the beaches, and I'll talk to that, I have a, a slide that I can show you. The beaches in Taiwan are too thin to support huge numbers of troops and tanks and artillery guns and equipment and ammunition and food and water and fuel and everything else to come across. You can't push that much across those thin beaches. And so what you do, from the PLA's perspective, to deal with that problem is you take some beach and then the nearby port facilities and the nearby air bases and you have all three because you need all three and you need to hold on to it and then weather the counterattacks that are expected and then form a, a landing zone, a solid landing zone. And then you, the second wave can come in and reinforce the guys that have, by this point, been chopped up pretty well on the first wave, then reinforce that and then to push inland. And so then the final stage of their war plan is what they call uh, operations, the fight on the island, right? And that's where they would be moving off of their beachheads seizing the key communication nodes, so the highways, for example, the bridges, the tunnels, and then pushing in to take Taipei and then other major cities. That's the final step. And then once that's in hand, then clearing out all the fragments uh, of what the defenders that are left, going house to house uh, and into the mountains and clearing out uh, the guerrilla uh, fighters, for example, and to try to do all of that in an environment where the United States may or may not come in at any time, or may be doing things that make their operations very uh, problematic, where the weather could be changing in ways that make their operations uh, very problematic, where they might just have bad luck. They might just lose the key brilliant general that they had, or the key admiral that they had to friendly fire, or to a sniper shot, or to you know, a JDAM, or, or whatever it may be, and then bad luck, and then things turn on them. And so to do that very, very quickly, that's what their thinking is all about. Now, what do they worry about? This was, this, I wanted to spend a chapter thinking about this, because oftentimes in Washington, D.C., when people do talk, as was mentioned, Professor Mersheimer, and I really enjoy his work, by the way, um, his, his theory, Offensive Realism, uh, and his book on the tragedy of, of great power uh, politics was something I really enjoyed reading in grad school. Um, and so I was very surprised when he did write that national interest article on Say Goodbye to Taiwan. But it created a good debate, I think, in Washington. Because this is something that we do need to think about and to debate. And a case does need to be made that Taiwan is, it does matter to the United States. It is worth defending in the face of, of a rising China. And so I think it's important, though, because unfortunately where the debate ended up coming out on, what the side was, most people came to the conclusion that Taiwan's a lost cause. The way Mersheimer did. They just looked at it and they projected into the future. They looked at the size of, of China's economy economic growth and the power, and they just saw China having this limitless power, seem limitless, its growth. That China was going to overtake the United States, and it was going to have then a budget not only larger than Taiwan's, maybe a hundred times larger than Taiwan's, and a military a hundred times larger, but then even larger than the United States. So people thought about this. Okay, well, so what does this mean? If, if you take that assumption to be true, if you accept that, well, then what does that say about the future? And so there was this pessimism that developed, I think, in Washington, D.C., and I think in Taipei as well, I think in many places. And so one of the things that struck me the most in doing this research was that while we are pessimistic, or we have been, I think most people have felt very pessimistic in, the, in US uh, defense circles and security circles and in Taiwanese defense and security circles looking at the rise of China and the implications for us. The PLA 
is actually very pessimistic too. So from our perspective, when we think about the future, a dark picture emerges. The sky is falling. Well, it's interesting. For the PLA, the same is true. And you would never, ever see that in their propaganda. You know, you read the Global Times editorial or the People's Daily or Xinhua, or you talk to any PLA general at a think tank in Washington, for example, and they're always thumping their chest and saying how it's inevitable. Unification is inevitable. No matter what Taiwan does, they might as well just give up now. No matter what the United States does, you might as well just give up now. It's inevitable that we're just going to take over. We will do whatever it takes. We will throw millions of lives away if we have to, to do this. We will destroy our economy if that's what it takes. And therefore, resistance is futile. You should just give, it's like if you watch Star Trek, right? It's the Borg, right? Why bother? Well, it's interesting. That's their propaganda line. And it's very well coordinated. And everybody sticks to those talking points, whether it's their Ministry of Foreign Affairs, whether it's their uh, propaganda department, whether it's the PLA, all of their, their publications for public consumption and for American consumption, especially for Taiwanese consumption, always follow that logic. But if you look at the internal documents, the Junei or Neibu, those writings are very different. Because those are not written by propagandists. Now, they still have to be politically correct, right? They still have to be uh, politically correct reflections of the party, the Chinese Communist Party's position. But because they're written for professional military officers, they can afford to be more candid and more pessimistic. Because you talk to any war planner anywhere, go out to Hawaii, you, you say, hey there, Colonel or Captain, how, how's the world look to you today? Oh, the sky's falling. Enemy's getting stronger all the time. We're getting weaker all the time. You go to Taipei, go out to MND. How's things? Oh my God, the PLA, they're getting, they're getting really buff and man, we're the sick. Our, our budget's not enough. And you go to London, you ask the Brits how they feel. Any professional military officer is going to tell you, because this is how they're trained to think, this is how they must think, it's part of their mission, that the threat is really severe and that it's going to be very difficult to keep up with it. And the PLA is no different. And that really struck me, is reading through all of their writings on the Taiwanese military and from their perspective, Taiwan is really tough. And the invasion of Taiwan is going to be a nightmare for them. That the Taiwanese are better led, than better trained, better equipped. The Taiwanese public is going to be resolved. And therefore, when they land on Taiwan, no one's going to pump gas for them. No one's going to give them food to eat. Maybe a poison in it, if they do. No one's going to help them. And so they, they make these assumptions, these pessimistic assumptions, and in their minds, the implications are grave. Therefore, we must train harder. We must get more and new equipment. We must reform our military. We must restructure. We must do all these things because if we don't, we'll never ever get to a place where if so ordered, we will be able to confidently, with a relatively high degree of success, because war is always a gamble. It's always a gamble. It's always a matter of probability but with a relatively high degree of success, uh, or relatively high probability of success, be able to invade and then occupy Taiwan. And so what are the things that PLA worries about? When professional military officers in China look at this operation, what do they worry about? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next one. Next one. Uh, next one. One of the first things they worry about is the offshore islands. They look at the location of Jinmen and Matsu and Dongin, the, the northernmost island uh, in Matsu. They look at Uchouyu, those tiny little islets that are there, just south of Nanrudal. And they think, oh my god, 
The Taiwanese control those granite fortresses right off of our major amphibious staging areas. And so once the war starts, and we're moving our armadas, our amphibious strike groups into position, and we're marshalling troops and equipment, and then we're starting to, to load aboard ships and helicopters, and transport aircraft, we're gonna be under fire. Because those islands are made of granite, and they're completely bunkered out. Unless we use a nuclear weapon on them, which seems unlikely, we can't, we can't, we can't neutralize them, we can't knock them out. And of course, the, the Chinese saw that in the first Taiwan Strait crisis, 1954-1955. Massive shelling went on. Again, second Taiwan Strait crisis, August of 58. Incredible, in the first wave in 1958, 40,000 shells were fired. And they were stunned by how few casualties Chiang Kai-shek's army suffered. Now, I know many of you uh, gentlemen have been on Jinmen, and so you know what those bunkers look like. And you know how you can sit underground for days at a time and be shelled and nobody gets hurt. Well, the PLA knows it too. And so they worry about those outer islands. That's something that they worry about. Something else they worry about. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and again, this just shows where potential uh, amphibious buildup zones and then how those can be impacted by the outer islands. If you think about those islands bristling with artillery guns, long-range long rockets, um, missile commandos, and what it, even a small unit could do if they're only a few miles away from major amphibious staging areas, the air bases, the, the command posts, the port facilities that the Chinese rely so heavily on. And so th this is something they worry about. They worry about the geography. They worry about the Penghu Islands. Because as they're crossing, there are some very long-range anti-ship cruise missiles deployed to the Penghu Islands. And that they can use those to cut in, potentially, if they're not neutralized, to cut into the flanks uh, of any unit that lands. Or if they go around the Penghus and just land directly on Taoyuan, for example, or Tainan, or Kaohsiung, Linyuan, then they have to worry about the units on the Penghus then tearing into their flanks. So that's something to worry about. When they look at the geography of the Taiwan Strait, a very unpleasant picture emerges to their collective military mind, as it would for any military professional. Next slide, please. Now this was something that I found fascinating, and I always wondered when I lived in Taiwan, if there ever was an invasion, where would they land? Where are the beaches in Taiwan that could be seized by the PLA? And so in the course of the research, I was able to come up with these 14 landing beaches. Now the uh, Taiwanese military, as some of you know, every year Taiwanese Marines uh, survey the entire coastline. And, and of course, the U.S. Marine Corps has done this too. We don't, as far as I understand, it's not something that is done regularly, but it has been done in the past, where they survey all the potential landing sites, and then they put the beaches into categories. Red beaches are the, the largest, they're the most dangerous, from a Marine's perspective. And then yellow beaches are kind of in the middle, right? If you could land a division, about 10,000 guys, on a red beach, then a yellow beach may be a brigade, about 5,000, give or take, depending on the type of unit and how many survived the crossing. And then the green beaches. Well, this, are, this is the, the 14 red and yellow beaches. I don't include the green beaches because the green beaches are only really accessible unless if you have a hovercraft, if, you, if you're like a, a frogman, if you're an unconventional unit. Right? For most large-scale units, you, you couldn't land there. And you certainly wouldn't see any of those green beaches become the focal point for a major uh, amphibious operation. Now, of these 14 beaches, and there used to be many more than this because they're shrinking over time, only two are red beaches. And one of them is uh, just north of Jilong, 
I believe it's Jinshan South. It could be Jinshan North. I think it's Jinshan South. Uh, and then the other is down at Jalutang in uh, Pingdong. Huge beach. That's where the, the Taiwanese Marines train. That's where the U.S. Marines train back when we had the, the MAG, the Military Assistance Advisory Group. Uh, that's where my grandfather was going to land if things would have gone differently in 1945. So these are the two really big beaches. Now, there were other big beaches. So, for example, uh, at, at Linko or at Haihu, if you take Route 15, so you go to Danshui, go across the Guandu Bridge, and then take Route 15 past the, the port of Taipei, and then down to Taoyuan Airport, what do you notice? That beach, which is one of the main focal points for a long, long time, has been eaten up by Route 15, right? So this highway, which has no off-ramps or on-ramps, has been built right over the beach. So what used to be this big, beautiful beach from the PLA's perspective is now this giant obstacle. And it's a defender's dream, right? Because you can hide under the bridge. You could hide inside under Route 15. Or you could just destroy it and just create a massive obstacle. Uh, and the same is true there at uh, Haihu. Just so when you land, when you go to Taoyuan, you land there, th that beach there, and the harbor, the fishing harbor there. Uh, this is, now it's a yellow beach. Uh, but it wasn't always, right? Th that coastline used to look different than it does today. And so this is another challenge that the PLA faces. When they look at the way Taiwan has developed over time, and the same is true at Kaohsiung, by the way, at Linyuan, so Linyuan used to have a much better beach to invade. The problem is, the, the Kaohsiung city government said, there's way too much erosion going on, and so we're going to build uh, breakwaters, tide breaks. We're going to put in um, uh, the wind farms for renewable energy. We're going to do these things that fundamentally change the nature of the coastline. And there's good reasons to do that for environmental protection. Well, it also helps make the coastline much more difficult for the enemy to land on. It's good for defensive reasons as well. So this is a problem that the PLA faces. So it's the geography, it's the timing of the attack, the weather, moving the troops and being able to do that and not be noticed by what they would consider enemy intelligence. And it's where do you land? How do you do that? How do you do that? The next slide, please. And so I analyzed uh, in the book what are the potential places where, according to Chinese military doctrine, we should really be concerned about. From their perspective, what would the most appealing landing zone look like? And this is the conclusion that I, I came to is that from the PLA's perspective and from the Taiwanese military's perspective, uh, and I, I don't know, but I suspect from the US government's perspective, uh, this is what you worry about. Because here, you have the Dantre River Delta, so you can push down there, and if you can get past the Guandu Bridge, which would not be easy, but if you could, then you can push down into Taipei itself on that river. You have the port of Taipei. So if you could seize just one of those piers, you wouldn't have to get them all. Some of them would be destroyed, no doubt. But if you could just get one, then you could pull up deep draft ships and start landing them and offload tanks and heavy, heavy units like that. You have the Jue Fish Harbor, where you could land lighter units. And then you have that, those beaches there, where you could land even lighter units. You have the airport. So it's the largest airport in, in Taiwan. Massive. And it's growing all the time. Right? New runways are being built up. And in addition to the airport that we all see when we fly in and out of Taoyuan International, there's also Dayuan. So Dayuan is right next door. It's the old Air Force base. That's right, it's now it's closed. But there's a long taxiway that connects the two. And so that airstrip is still there. The hardened aircraft shelters are still there. And then the debate is what to do with it, right? So there's, there's all these different development schemes of 
you know, leveling that and turning it into something else. Uh, but it's undecided. But if you're an attacker and you're looking at the geography, you think, well, this is great. I've got all these airstrips where I can drop my paratroopers. I can land my helicopters. I've got the beaches that are there. And they're not great beaches. They're not big beaches. But they're good. They're good. They're good enough. And then you've got the, the river delta. You've got the ports. And from the PLA's perspective, all this is so important because this particular location is very close to Taipei, which is the, the, the center of gravity. It's the prime target. Very close to Taipei. And it provides, once you land, there's enough open space where then you can flow in massive numbers of reinforcements. You know, once the first wave lands. And so this was, this is an area where uh, you know, I don't dare make any predictions, but I certainly, uh, just based on the research, think that um, th this is probably the most likely place for the PLA to attack. Now, of course, this is the reason why, if you look at the way that the uh, ROC military, the Taiwanese military, is deployed the way they are, and if you look at all those units that are there, the 66th Marine Brigade, for example, there at um, uh, Linko, just actually just south of. You look at the, the mechanized infantry brigade at uh, Yangmei. You look at the, the, art, the massive artillery units that are, that are there in Taoyuan County. You look at the two armor brigades that are there at Hukou, close by. You look at how Zhongli is the headquarters for the 6th Army uh, group. You look at how protecting the Danshui River is the, the Guandu command how the Taiwanese military has been strategically positioned and tanks are in place, artillery guns are in place, the ammunition's in place, the bunkers, the tunneling, everything is in place and all the plans are in place for this potential nightmare scenario, this catastrophe. And this is what the units prepare for. And if you go down to Tainan, for example, it's the same there. If you go to Taichung, the same there. All the, the local units know exactly the lay of the land and where they have to defend. What are the key nodes that they have to think about? And so for the guys that do this, and the, the men and women that do this, for a living, this is what they're thinking about all the time. So let me talk a little bit now about Taiwan's war plan, Taiwan's operational plan, the, the Guan operational plan. Um, and I think it's important to talk about this because oftentimes, again, we end up getting to a place where we're just admiring the problem, right? And if you just focus on the threat, if you just admire the threat, a couple things will happen to you that could kind of tarnish the quality of your analysis, especially from the policy perspective in Washington, D.C. The first bad thing that will happen is you, you just get very pessimistic. You're like Eeyore. You know, if you watch Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore is always, the sky is falling, I can't believe anybody even wants to talk to me things are so terrible, you become like Eeyore, right? And so people that just focus on the threat all the time end up getting to a very dark place. Uh, and then if you have that mindset, nothing is possible for you. You lose hope, which is exactly what the Chinese military is hoping will happen in Taiwan and in Washington, D.C. The second unpleasant thing that will happen, especially in Washington, D.C., is Taiwan will lose all agency. It becomes a contest between the United States and China. Taiwan has no role in that. Taiwan is just this empty space, it's the battlefield, but it has no part to play. And if Taiwan has no part to play, then, well, first of all, we're losing a potentially very capable uh, partner and ally. So that's a problem because more Americans have to die because we've just completely disregarded cooperation with our ally. But also the other bad thing that happens is on the Taiwan side, if nobody in the world is treating Taiwan with any sense of agency, if you're, not, if you're a country that's not treated as a country, if you're a people that's not treated like normal people, you take your passport and you can't even go to the United Nations on a tour, Right? You don't get a vote. And when it comes to even a matter of life and death, war and peace, there's no, no role to play. It's just 
yeah, either the United States comes and saves us, and then we'll be fine, or they don't come, and then we're doomed, right? If you have that mentality, that takes you to a very dark place, right? If you lose that sense of independence, sovereignty, and agency, the ability to make your own decisions, the ability to take control of your own fate and your own future, to have self-determination, if you lose that, well, you lose resolve. It saps morale. And again, this is exactly what the Chinese want. Especially from the Chinese war planners and Chinese propagandists and agents of influence. This is exactly what they want because they know good and well that if the United States and Taiwan work together, if we cooperate more closely, then as a team, and it wouldn't just be us, by the way, it'd also be Japan and other democracies, working together as a team will always be much stronger than they are. No matter how large China's economy gets, no matter how tough their military gets, we'll always be better than them. We'll always be stronger than them if we're a team. But if they can split us apart and sap us of our morale and defeat us in our heads, because war is not just about what we see on CNN and on the battlefields, that's one important battle, but there's an important battle that happens before that. The battle of the mind always goes before the battle of the fist, right? Can you destroy somebody's thinking? Can you destroy their heart, their resolve, before you actually have to, to destroy them physically? If you've seen the movie Dunkirk, it's a great movie. I'd highly recommend it. Um, it's really, the first scene is very powerful. There's this group of uh, British um, infantrymen, and they're retreating through the streets of Dunkirk, and all of a sudden, all these propaganda leaflets are dropped on them. And they pick them up, and the Nazi propaganda has a picture of them, their unit in Dunkirk, surrounded by all these arrows of all the Nazi units that are coming in. And that's classic psychological warfare. The message is, yes, you still have a gun in your hand. Yes, you could still resist. You could still fight if you wanted. But, but your defeat is just a matter of time. So you might as well just give up now. That's classic psychological warfare. And so again, this is what uh, the Chinese are trying to do to the United States every single day and to Taiwan every single day, is to, to beat us in our heads and our hearts. Uh, and so this is why I think it's important to talk about things like Taiwan's war plan. Because Taiwan does have agency. Taiwan does get a vote. It's not just a contest between the United States and China. If there's a war, if there's a crisis, let alone if there's a full invasion, Taiwan gets a vote. And the Taiwanese military assumes that the United States might not show up. We might not intervene. Or we might not intervene fast enough. And so if you're a war planner in Taipei, there are three nightmare scenarios that you worry about. The first is that the United States just loses its nerve and just doesn't show up. For whatever reason, the president, just whatever reason, doesn't send the fleet in, doesn't, doesn't show up. And so you have to fight independent defense. Second nightmare scenario is the United States shows up, but it's too slow. The Chinese got the drop on us. They're too fast. They're able to achieve their objectives too quickly. So by the time that the United States is able to bring sufficient military power to bear, by the time the Seventh Fleet really arrives in force, and the Air Force, those B-2 bombers from Missouri and everybody else, by the time they show up, it's too late. The facts on the ground have changed to such an extent that the game is over. So that's a nightmare. The third nightmare is that the U.S. is there right away. It's like 1996 all over again, and we've got aircraft carriers ready to rumble. They're right there, 100 miles off the coast, got you know, combat air patrol, you've got the fighters up, everybody's ready. You've got the, the submarines all lined up in the Western Pacific, and we're ready so that if the, Chi and the Taiwanese are ready, and so that if, they're, if the Chinese do go crazy and try to invade Taiwan, we're ready. But then what happens? Well then, the Chinese military knows 
And so then they sink our aircraft carriers with their torpedoes and with their anti-ship ballistic <coughs> missiles and cruise missiles and drones. And they paralyze our air units. They flatten our air bases uh, with missiles and commandos and everything else. They paralyze our communications in space and cyber, across cyberspace. And they're able to knock us onto the back foot for long enough for them to achieve their objectives. And so those are the three nightmare scenarios. If you're a war planner in Taipei, and if you look at the Guan operational plan, um, now I, I must admit, I've not seen it. It's a classified document. I have no place looking at something like that, uh, looking at something like that. But uh, as I understand it from reading uh, the professional military journals and talking to people in Taipei, uh, it is based on that foundational assumption that Taiwan probably won't have to fight independently. The US will probably be fighting shoulder to shoulder. It will probably not get destroyed by Chinese surprise attacks. And it will probably arrive in time. But we have to prepare for the worst. So if you prepare for the worst, what does that look like? What it looks like is three stages of operations. So just as the PLA has three big stages of operation, the first is the blockade and the, bomb, the bombing, softening Taiwan up for an invasion. The second is the actual amphibious invasion. And the third is fighting on the island, conquering the island. The Guan plan has three phases to deal with that. The first phase is force preservation, mobilization. So you protect the leadership. You protect your key assets. You bunker them down. You put them underground. You hide them. You put them in the mountains. You move people, your key leaders. You don't keep them in one place. You move units around. You have all kinds of deception operations that go on so that when the war starts and the missiles are flying, not everybody's going to survive, but enough can be preserved for the next stage of the fight. So that's the first stage, is protecting your top leaders and uh, preserving your strength, all while mobilizing reservists and civilians, mobilizing the society for the attack. Putting obstacles on the beaches, for example, laying mines, right? Land mines and sea mines. Um, putting explosives on the bridges so that if you need to, you can drop them. If you need to, you can destroy the port facilities to deny them to the enemy. Hopefully you'll never need to. Hopefully the Chinese will never get to that stage in, their, in the, their war plan. But if you do, you're ready for it. So these are the types of things that would go on in the first stage of this operation. The second stage is joint interdiction. So this is what, what happens if the Chinese are able to get control of the air, the sea, <coughs> cyberspace. What if they do? make the plunge across the Taiwan Strait. But that's where the second stage comes in, is being able to interdict, to intercept and destroy as much as you possibly can from the, the, is the greatest range as you possibly can to attrit their forces, to weaken and reduce their forces as they're, first as they're marshalling uh, on the Chinese coast, and then as they're starting to cross. So that's what the, the second, stage is all about. And then the final stage is homeland defense, right? That is where you're actually fighting on the beaches. And God forbid you're fighting in the suburbs, in urban areas. That's the street fight. That's fighting for the capital. It's falling back. It's line after line of defense. Falling back, uh, if so required, into the mountains. So it's a stage by stage. It's a layered defense. That's what, it's a if you ever go aboard a U.S. Uh, destroyer uh, or a cruiser and you talk to naval officers about how they do air defense, how do you defend against incoming missiles, for example? If you're out there with your destroyer and you've got to protect the aircraft carrier, how do you defend against massive numbers of missiles coming? Well, it's a layered defense. I've got my real long-range SM-3s, the standard missile three, they can go way up and out. And then if that doesn't work, or if there's still enough left, SM2s, SM1s, then I've got this, then I've got that, then I've got the Gatling guns that come out that last mile. 
the, the sea, they call them sea woods, they're like giant Gatling guns with the depleted uranium shells. Then I've got my guys, the electronic warfare guys, are pumping out electrons into the atmosphere to try to scramble the seekers, to try to jam up. It's a layered defense, and that's what you do. And that's what the Taiwanese military prepares to do, is it's an if-then. First, I'm going to do this. If that doesn't work, then I'll do that. And if that doesn't work, then I'll do this. And it's all the way in. And so what you don't want to do is to be in a position where you just have like a, a, a um, if you're familiar with the history of World War II, uh, a, a Magno line, right? One line, one really strong, well-fortified uh, coast, coastline, but you've got nothing behind that and you've got nothing in front of that. You want it layered. You want to be able to, to fight them as far away as possible. And if they still come, then you fight them even a little closer and a little closer all the way across. And so that's what it looks like. And so a chapter of the book talks about that. And then finally, uh, next slide, please. So this is, for anyone who's interested, these are the major military uh, Taiwanese, major Taiwanese <coughs> military bases. Um, next slide. These are the locations of U.S. military bases. Not all of them, but these would be the main ones for this scenario. Next slide. Okay, so before I talk about the final uh, conclusion of the book, just very briefly, why this as the cover? You know, most studies when they talk about um, a war in the Taiwan Strait or Taiwan security issues in general, there's always that cool picture of the F-16 taken off at Hualien, or Jiayi, right? Or it's ships transiting the Taiwan Strait. Because that's generally what people think about. They think about the, the air war and the war at sea. People don't generally think about the knife fight. Because ultimately, that's what the invasion of Taiwan is. It's not just the war in the air, which seems abstract. You can't see that. It's not just the fight on the sea. When a ship goes down and thousands of lives are lost, it happens silently. It's, it's over the horizon. We don't see it happen. But the thing about invasion is, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of guys fighting each other at very close range in the streets and on the beaches and in the mountains and underground. It's a knife fight. Because by the time you get to this stage in a war, everything's happening up close. And everything's extremely bloody and extremely brutal. And one of the things that struck me about PLA writings on their envisioned campaign against Taiwan is they never talk about avoiding civilian casualties. I thought that was remarkable and disturbing. That they're talking literally about fighting in the streets of Taoyuan and Taipei and Tainan and Kaohsiung and Taichung and everywhere else places where millions and millions of innocent people live. Men, women, children, dogs and cats. And they're all gonna get bombed and they're all gonna get burned. They're all gonna be sitting there with no power, no water, after a few days into the war. And the PLA doesn't care. They don't care. They assume that after the war is over, the peop those that are left in Taiwan are gonna despise them. And it's going to be like Tibet all over again, or it's going to be like Xinjiang all over again. And then it becomes a police state. It becomes an Orwellian police state because that's what they would have to do. They just take that for granted. They just assume that to be the case. And it's really cold and disturbing when you read their writings on this operation and you read about how they view civilians and, and collateral damage, what, what we euphemistically call collateral damage, accidentally killing innocent people, non-combatants. Right? Well, this breaks all the rules of war, right? Because war has its own law. There are con international conventions for what you can and can't do in war that most modern militaries follow. But PLA doesn't talk about that in their guidance to their officers at their command academies where they're training these guys for this really ugly fight. And so in addition to all of the other many reasons to want to avoid this catastrophe, the number one reason is because it would be bloody and brutal. 
it would be a crime against humanity. It would be the kind of thing that people 30 years or 50 years later would look back on and curse whoever was in power that let that happen. If this ever actually happened, if this ever stopped being just theoretical, something that people worried about, it actually happened, people would look back and they would curse the government in Taipei and they would curse the government in Washington, D.C. and they would say, how could you have not seen this coming? How could you have ever let this happen? In the same way that people now in England look back and they curse Neville Chamberlain, right? They curse the, the 30s generation. How could you have not have seen what was coming? How could you have let Adolf Hitler do what he did to us, right? This is something that we need to take seriously, not because it's probable that it's going to happen, not because I believe this is inevitable, not, not because I believe that this is going to happen, but because it could. And we have no way of predicting the future. We have no way of knowing what the future will bring. We don't know what the world a year or two from now is going to look like. We have even less of an idea what the world five to ten years from now is going to look like. And so we have to prepare for it. Even if you believe, as I believe, that Taiwan has a future. That Taiwan is actually better defended than most people realize. That the PLA is actually more pessimistic about their war plans than most people realize. But even if you believe all that to be true, even if you, you read the book, and you think to yourself, wow, I didn't realize Taiwan was as prepared as they seem to be for this particular scenario. Even if that's true, even if it's a 1% chance, we have, we have to get ready. We have to do more to prepare for it. And so the, the final chapter of the book is trying to bring all that together. So first, to admire the problem, to describe the problem, to second, to talk about what the Taiwanese are potentially capable of, the Taiwanese military, what they're thinking about, and then finally to talk about the implications for U.S. strategy and U.S. policy. And that's where I, and I won't go through it all and bore you all with it, but that's where I talk about, okay, if this is a real threat, and if it's something that is understudied, something that has not been ignored, but something that we've not invested enough intellectual capital in, and maybe not enough military training in, then what can we do? How can we get to a place where we can deter this, th this potential uh, enemy from ever attacking us, that we can convince them that they don't want to do this? Because deterrence is in the eye of the beholder, right? So if you can understand your, your adversary's thinking, and you will never understand it perfectly, and your adversary's decision making, and again, we'll never understand it perfectly, but if you can understand it a, a little bit better, then you can figure out what makes them tick, you can figure out what they are worried about, and then you can try to use that to your advantage. Where they see their strengths, your strengths, their weaknesses, your weaknesses, and you can do things to change the trend lines. And so that's what the final chapter talks about is, what could we do, what could the United States do, what could the Trump administration or any administration in 2020, 2024, do to make this nightmare, to make sure this nightmare never comes true, to reduce the probability of war, to keep peace, to keep Asia uh, peaceful and prosperous. Because if you look at where we are today, I would assert that we're looking at an increasingly dark picture. The Chinese are doing things to coerce Taiwan. They're doing things to undermine stability in this area. And if you couple their actions with what we know they write about and they think about and they train to and they're building their military up to do and you think about it, then at least the conclusion that I came to is we have to take this more seriously and we have to do something about it. Um, and so with that, let me open it up to questions or comments or reactions, and thank you all very much for, uh, for being here and for uh, your interest in this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
everyone. We are entering the third session of the Hong Kong Hall of Fame. Uh, you speak louder when you ask a question, okay? And then after two questions, you answer, and so then we we'll take a Perfect. Third and fourth question. Sounds great. Okay, first one. Okay, thank you. First of all, I'm from Hong Kong. How would the PLA read the book? Let's say if I was PLA, Central Command, reading your book. What do you expect me to think about what you are writing? The second question is... Oh, no, only one question. Oh. Two. The more the merrier, I'd say. Okay, one question, one question. The second question is, the China actually, in my opinion, doesn't want to invade Taiwan. They only want to do it with their own timetable. Okay? If they want to do it, they could have done it. They couldn't have done it, whatever the case may be. But China, in my opinion, manipulates the situation to his own advantage. So, in fact, they didn't want to do it, but they'll make sure that <coughs> this kind of strategy is within their own timetable. So I have two questions. Okay. If you have time, I have a third. Okay. Since, since there's two questions, the whole that's more. Yeah, I will, you will be next. Okay. You can answer two questions. Well, those are very good questions. And I've, I've wondered the same thing about how would this be received in China? How would the, the PLA High Command uh, view it? And I took some comfort in the thought that no one's going to read this in China. This is going to be censored, right? No one's going to read this. Uh, so I don't have to worry about that problem. Um, but then I thought, well, maybe a few might. Be kind of neat if they did, right? And I think how you would view it, if you're in the Chinese high command, and I have very little knowledge of how they see the world, um, but I've met actually quite a few PLA generals, um, and I've read a lot of their writings, and <coughs> seen them give a lot of talks. I think how you view a book like this depends greatly upon, are you a political officer, are you an intelligence officer, a propagandist, or are you an operator? So is your job to deal with the psychological operations, the deception operations, and all the rest of it, or is your job to actually lead a battalion of guys, or a brigade of guys, off the ship and onto those beaches, right? Or off those helicopters? And I think depending on where you sit and what you do for a living, it, it's going to change your, your thinking greatly on it. What I suspect is that the political officers probably won't like this book at all because it goes against a lot of their talking points. It goes against a lot of their narratives. So they're probably not going to receive the book very well. And they're probably going to have to spend a lot of time uh, in the Global Times or the China Review News uh, or other... other um, state controlled or funded or influenced media to tarnish my reputation, which they have, um, or to tarnish the reputation of my think tank because of this book, which they have, or my boss, Randy, Sh former boss, Randy Shriver, which they have. Uh, and they're gonna do all those things, which actually I don't mind at all. I, I just view it as free publicity. Um, but they're, they're gonna do that because they have to do that. They have to <coughs> change the debate now. But if you're an operator, if you're in the Chinese high command and it's your job to actually think about invading Taiwan, you're probably going to look at s at least some of the things in that book. And some of them you're probably just going to write it off. Be like, yeah, that guy's a civilian. He's a, you know, a think tank researcher. He doesn't know anything about what I know as a military professional. You know, so he's got it all wrong. So that, that could be the case, that they're going to read it and just be like, that guy's an idiot. Well, he doesn't know the first thing about, you know, what I know about this operation. Or they could read and be like, yeah, he's got it 70, 80, 90% right. And the takeaway is, this really is every bit as bloody as we anticipate. This really is every bit as awful as we anticipate. And I really would lose 80 to 90% of my guys, my brothers in arms, if we actually were ordered to do this. Now, they're not all going to be killed. So a lot of them will. They'll drown. They'll be shot. They'll be bombed. They'll be burned. 
some of them will live, and those that live are going to have to be in a wheelchair the rest of their life. You know, you look at American soldiers coming back from the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. My neighbor doesn't have his legs. You walk through the halls of the Pentagon. Look at the number of guys that don't have legs or arms as a result of this war. And that's, a, that's low intensity. We're talking about as high intensity as you can possibly go. So the number of people that are going to lose life and limb. Or be like my grandpa, who still has nightmares. He's 94, but because he landed in, on all those islands, and because he killed so many people and saw so many of his friends died, you still, you still are haunted by that. It's forever. War is forever. You can't take it back. There's a lot of stupid things that policymakers can do, civilian policymakers can do. But if they order generals and admirals to go to war with each other, there's no taking that back. Ever. It's forever. And it lingers for generation. And so I agree with your second observation that any logical, rational person within the Chinese Communist Party or the PLA is probably going to look at this and say, you know, we don't want to do this. Or we want to do this on our timetable. We want to do it years, maybe decades from now, when everything favors us, when the world looks very different than it does today. Because any any normal human being, any rational thinking man or woman, is going to look at this and say, no way. I don't want a million people to die. I don't want five million people to, to die. I don't want to do that. I don't want to destroy my economy. I don't want to take those risks. And it wouldn't be as easy as what the Chinese propaganda would have you believe. And so I, I agree with you. I think they want everyone in Taiwan and the United States to believe that they're resolved to actually do this. And that if they were resolved to actually do this as a result of A, B, or C, then they could do it, and it would be over within days. They also want us to believe that they've had the ability to do this for many years, and the only reason they haven't done it is because of A, B, or C, whatever excuses they come up with. The reality is the PLA is not ready to do this. They haven't been ready. They haven't been ready from July of 1949 when Field Marshal Su Yu and his deputy started planning, because that's it was July of 1949 that the PLA first ordered its generals to prepare for the invasion of Taiwan. It's when they first started the first draft. They had a blank piece of paper, and they said, "How are we going to do this? Mao Zedong wants us to invade Taiwan. How are we going to do it?" And so they started. From 1949 until today, the PLA, for a variety of reasons, and I go through that in the second chapter of the book, has not been ready to do this. They're not ready to do this today. That if they were so ordered by Xi Jinping, there's a very high probability of failure for them. I can't stand before you and tell you that it's 100% guarantee that they would lose. Because, again, war is a gamble, right? But it would be a Hail Mary pass. It would be, it would be you know, in the single digits that they would lose, that Taiwan would win, and then the CCP would probably collapse if they ordered the invasion of Taiwan for this year, next year, 2020. But as time goes on, if the current trend lines hold true into the 2020s, the probability of success for the PLA is going to keep going up. You know, what was once single digits, you know, we figured we had a 3% chance or a 5% chance, will become a 13% chance, a 15% chance. Pretty soon, it's a 50-50. Well, if I'm in Vegas, I, I personally don't gamble, but if, you know, I know people do. If you're in Vegas, 50-50 shot, that's, those are good gambling odds. So you do it. If it's a 50-50, especially in a time of tension, especially if there's things going on domestically within the PRC, where the party's life is at stake for other reasons and they need to distract public opinion or whatever else happens in the future, right? So the key thing, I, I believe, is that we need to continue to signal to the PRC and to the PLA that we know what you're thinking about doing and it would be a nightmare for everybody. You too. We have a vote and that we're preparing to defend ourselves if you do engage in this <coughs> naked act of aggression against us and our allies, and so you better not do it. 
and so to keep the probability of success for the PLA very low into the future because I would argue to you that if the current trend lines hold, that probability is going to keep going up and it could start going up much faster than we may be prepared to deal with, right? Because anytime you build up a military, building up a military, as I understand it, is like learning a foreign language. You know, when you do a military buildup, if you pump a lot of money into a military, it's like moving to another country to try to learn a language. And I can empathize with this. The first year you study a foreign language, you get very, very little in return, even if you're working at it 40 hours, 50 hours a week. You know, you can't get into a cab and get your way to the train station hardly. You can just greet people politely. The second year, you get very little in return. The third year, you start to get a lot. And by the fourth and fifth year, you can become very, very fluent. And it's that way when you build up a military too, that the first few years of your investment, you don't get much in return. But over time, it has an exponential growth, potentially, <coughs> because of the investments you're making in professional military education, in leadership, in training, in equipment, and structure, and everything else. And so we have to make sure that now that the PLA is reforming itself, and they're developing joint operational capabilities, because they are, in a big way, well, what joint operation is the PLA preparing for? What is it? Why, what is it that's driving China's sweeping military reform program? Well, if you look at their, at least according to their own doctrine, the number one joint campaign or joint operation they have to worry about is, is the invasion of Taiwan. So if we know that to be true, then we have to do things to keep that probability lower uh, over time. Okay. Next question. My name is Jack. I uh, retired aerospace engineer from the defense industry. You talk about three states that uh, PLA plan to uh, invade Taiwan. The first stage is uh, Bambao, is the radar station, uh, military base of C4. Uh, Taiwan has about, to my knowledge, Taiwan has about a few hundred of the uh, Xiongfo 2E cruise missile at about 1,000 kilometer range. So they can return the fire right immediately after the first stage. And uh, President Tsai approved that uh, even extended the 2E the, to about 2,000 kilometers. If not enough, uh, we will borrow a uh, get loan from the uh, US for, <laughs> for Tomahawk, a <laughs> uh, 500 uh, uh, range. So uh, I think uh, after this first stage uh, with Taiwan return fire, the war is over. And, uh, and the limited casualty. And Taiwan can return the fire to their military base, uh, power plant or refinery plant, whatever, to, to, uh, to destroy all this uh, infrastructure. So I think that the war will be over then, and limited casualty, and, uh, and the US uh, will not have even one casualty. That's, that's what so what, <laughs> excuse me, what is your question? That's right. No, come on. That's true, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Neku. Um, I want to ask you, if any war is very good, so the best way is to prevent a war. Now, how to prevent a war? Um, you know, we need to psychologically and the readiness of the military to focus. So, if you have a chance to talk to the official of Taiwanese government, such as President Tsai, what would you advise him? And what do you think the weakest point of Taiwan's defense toward the China, uh, China's threats? Because Taiwan simply don't want to be a sitting down. Okay, this question. Okay, so let me, let me address that question. And that's a, that's a question I've gotten a few times in recent months, and it always makes me a little uncomfortable because I don't feel um, entitled or well-equipped to provide advice to elected leaders in Taiwan uh, or, or military professionals because I know that President Tsai and her cabinet, officials of the National Security Council, have thought through this very carefully and they've studied this problem. And I know some of these guys personally um, and I know they know a lot more than I do. And I know MND and the, the generals, the professionals that have dedicated 30 years of their life or 40 years of their life for training and equipment and preparing to get ready for this, this nightmare scenario, uh, know this inside and out. And so I've spent just a few years of my life 
looking at this as a civilian, as an outside researcher, um, these guys have spent decades. And it's their life that's on the line, right? If there is a war, that these will be the first people that will die. And so they have a much greater stake than, than I do, um, even though I, go, I spend a lot of time in Taiwan um, visiting. And so I'm not sure that I have a good answer. There, there's no easy answer to that question because I don't feel uh, well positioned uh, or entitled to provide advice uh, to the Taiwanese government. Um, I would point out, uh, and I do in the book, that it may be useful to have outside views on this issue, and it may be useful to have someone look at what the PLA thinks about and what they worry about in order to come to a conclusion of, okay, what might we do about it? And certainly this is true uh, because I do feel entitled as an American, as a taxpaying American citizen, to provide my own government with uh, recommendations and advice, even though, again, I feel under-equipped to do that. Uh, but I'm more comfortable with that idea because my own politics, it's my own uh, system. Uh, but the conclusion, uh, which is not dissimilar to your own, sir, is that the Chinese do worry a lot about counter-strike capabilities. They worry a lot about Chinese, uh, Taiwanese missiles. They don't like the Xiongfeng 2E. They really don't like the Xiongfeng 2E. They don't like the Leiting Liang Qian, you know, the multiple launch rocket system. And they really don't like those being deployed at, at, um, at Dongyin, you know, up close, right along the coast. They don't like the fact that Taiwan has a vote, that Taiwan has developed capabilities where it can fight back. It does have some counter-strike capabilities. And that, that goes into the joint interdiction, which could theoretically start as soon as the Chinese have fired on Taiwan, and the Taiwanese can fire back. So that's something that worries them. Now, what are the implications for numbers? You know, how much is enough? I don't know. Clearly, it's a good capability. It's good to have those types of strategic counter-strike capabilities because of the deterrent effect that's there. What else bothers the PLA? at least in terms of deterrence. Now, I don't know exactly what bothers their tactical and operational guys, you know, because what scares the commander of the 1st Mechanized Infantry Division, you know, the guy's gonna be the first going, hitting the beaches of Taiwan, or the guys in those helicopter units that are deployed to Fujian province, what scares them, you know, at the tactical level, is going to look very different to the things that, that scares the operational planners uh, in the command centers in Nanjing or Beijing, right? And what scares those generals or the admirals in Ningbo or in Zhangjiang, the guys that sit there, what scares them is going to be very different than what scares the political leadership in Zhongnanhai in Beijing. And so it's important to think through, okay, if I'm developing capabilities like the Xiongfeng 2E, or like submarines, or advanced fighters, or more training for my reservists, or a better handgun, or a better landmine, or whatever it is, from the, the, you know, from the floor on up. Who am I communicating to? Who am I deterring here? Who am I scaring, really? Who am I trying to intimidate? Who am I trying to convince not to attack me in the first place? And so, what the conclusion I think most military professionals have come to, and most national security professionals have come to, is I need it all. I need it all. That I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. I do need a layered defense. I need the Xiongfeng 2 E's. In the future, I'll need the Xiongfeng 3 E's. I'll need the, the multiple launch rockets that can go 45 kilometers, the ones that can go 30 kilometers, the ones that can go 15 kilometers. And Pretty soon I'm going to need the ones that can go 300 kilometers too, right? I'm going to need all that. I'm going to need helicopters. I'm going to need infantry. I'm going to need artillery. I need, I need it all. Because none of those are ironclad. None of those are foolproof. All of those can be defeated. And so the more problems you can present the enemy with, the more you can complicate his plans. 
And so you need, a, you need it all. The question is, okay, here's my defense budget. Here's what I can afford. Here's what I think the United States may or may not be helping me with. And here's what public opinion says about that. Here's what the legislative UN says about my budget. And it's, this is all dynamic, right? This changes over time. And so it becomes the, a question of, of not what I need, because I think that's pretty well understood, but how much of each and how to do it. And if you ask me where I see a potential um, weakness, you know, the number one potential weakness, because Taiwan has a lot of, I think, understudied or unknown strengths, the number one potential weakness is a morale. When I do speak to people in Taiwan, both civilians and military officers, there is this question of resolve and morale. There are too many Taiwanese, both civilians and uniformed officers, that believe that they lack agency, that believe that they don't have a vote, that believe it might be inevitable. And so if you talk to people, for example, on the, the, the um, pro-unification side, because the beautiful thing about de democracy is, one of the things I love about Taiwan society and talking to people there and having these intellectual exchanges is everyone is open, everyone is honest, everyone has an opinion. It's like the United States. And it's okay. That's protected by the Constitution. That's protected under law. And so you have those people that want unification. I know people who say, you know, unification is inevitable. It'd be great if, if we would just surrender now unify the two sides, and then it'll be peace and, and harmony, and our, our economy will pick up, and it'll just be like the good old days when Chiang Kai-shek was in charge, and back then, you know, the youngsters knew to respect their elders and everything else. So you have those, it's, it's a very small minority, right? It's kind of a radical fringe that, that wants unification on China's terms. But, so you have those guys, and where does that come from? It comes from a place of defeat. They've already been defeated in their hearts and minds that, you know, China's, it's inevitable we're going to lose, and so we, we should lose with grace. We should lose on our own terms, right? We should surrender our sovereignty and, you know, do it that way. It's interesting, though. You go to the opposite end of the spectrum, and you talk to people who say, I want Taiwan independence like yesterday. I don't want it today, I don't want it tomorrow, I want it yesterday. We should have been an independent country, you know, decades ago. Well, some of them, I've observed, feel that way. And by the way, Taiwan's already a sovereign, independent country under its current ROC constitution. The problem is it's just not recognized as such. Taiwan's a country that's not treated as a country. That the U.S. and Taiwan don't have diplomatic relations. Taiwan's not given the respect and dignity in the international <coughs> community that it deserves. That's the real fundamental problem, I think. But you talk to people who say, we need to declare de jure independence, change the constitution, change the flag, and we need to have done it years ago. We scratch the surface a little bit. For some people, that, that desire stems from a sense of lacking agency lacking a sense of self-respect and, and dignity that comes from international recognition, right? And that makes perfect sense, that the only way Taiwan can be recognized is if we do this thing. And if you talk to, or if, at least if you look at polling data, a surprising number of young people in Taiwan now say, we want to declare independence even if it means war with China. Well, you ask them why. Because most American observers in Washington, D.C., would say, you've got to be crazy. China is so powerful. They have all those ballistic missiles and, and everything else. If you do that and then they attack, a million people could die. How, how, how can that be worth it, right? Well, they would say, and it's quite rational and quite logical, they would say, look at the trend line. Look at the trend line. That today, China is already so powerful that they can deny us access to the UN. We can't even go on tours there with the ROC passport. That's today. What is the world gonna look like five years from now? 
or 10 years from now, when they can potentially invade us on a whim, and they can defeat the United States, where the United States won't dare come to our aid, then we'll be truly doomed. And so it's better to fight now. If there has to be a fight, and if this fight is inevitable, if this deadlock cannot be broken any other way, then it's better to do it sooner, because we're still relatively strong, and the United States is still relatively strong. So better to fight now and get it over with, and then we'll win, and then the world will recognize us, and the CCP will collapse, probably. Right? So it's better to take that risky decision earlier than later. And that's true, rationally speaking. If you do believe that China's <laughs> rise I is inevitable, and the United States' decline is inevitable, and Taiwan's decline is inevitable, then that makes a lot of sense, right? Better to fight war sooner than, than later. Most people, though, as I understand it, are somewhere in, betwe in between. They don't feel so desperate as to surrender now or as to fight, a, you know, provoke a war now. They're somewhere in between. Because most people look at it and say, yeah, we have strengths, we have weaknesses, that the future has not yet been written, and we can shape the future. That we can do things to change the future, to make it more favorable to us. And that gradually, the United States and other democracies will start to recognize us, little by little, that will start to, to treat us with more respect and dignity. And maybe at the same time, China will reform. You know, it's not inevitable that China will always be this kind of authoritarian, increasingly Orwellian police state. You know, that Xi Jinping has, has surprised a lot of people with how much of a dictator he's become over the past five years, with the cult of personality and everything, all the purges and everything else. But it's not inevitable that just because the trend lines have been unfavorable, politically speaking, they'll always be unfavorable. And so uh, I think that's why it's important to have a sense of, of perspective, to realize that we have strengths, we have weaknesses, the future's not yet been written, and there's no need to do things out of desperation, right? I, on, on any, you know, for the United States to do things in desperation, because the same people that argue we should abandon Taiwan are the people that argue, again, that the future has already been written. Everything's inevitable. That China's going to surpass us, and so we should, we should just gracefully start giving up now. Um, and so, again, I think that's why it's so important that Taiwan, uh, people in Taiwan do realize that a lot of China's narratives and a lot of the narratives that we see come out of Chinese state media are false that that's strategic psychological warfare, that's propaganda, that there's a lot of myths that surround cross-strait relations and that surround Taiwan's defense and defensibility and that surround the United States and our politics and the strength or the weakness of our forces. There's a lot of myths that are out there and it's getting worse over time because the Chinese are very good at fake news. You've all seen the images of the, the H6 bomber circling Yushan right? That's completely false. But it looks pretty real when you look at it the first time, right? Things like that. And this is going to get worse. This campaign of coercion, this strategic psychological warfare is going to get worse. And so the biggest threat, um, the thing that I worry about the most, and there are other things, more, I guess, hardcore military side too, but uh, the biggest is that, that psychological piece. I worry about folks in Taiwan um, surrendering to their fear and then that leading to either defeatist behavior <coughs> or very very provocative <coughs> behavior uh, in the future and I worry about the same with Washington DC that people in Washington will surrender to their fear because as human beings <coughs> we don't think straight when we're afraid right you just don't when when someone can get to you and they can make you afraid, they can control you, and you will not act rationally at that time. Right? It's the fight or flight, it's the adrenaline rush, it's all the rest of it. And so the Chinese are very good at manipulating that. 
And you have people in, in the PLA, for example, that have PhDs in psycholinguistics <laughs> and in the use of language, because language can be a powerful weapon, right? Language is magic. I think that as, as somebody who, you know, and I'm biased, but as somebody who writes a lot, um, mm -hmm. as an analyst, I think words are powerful. Well, if you connect words with emotion, that's even more powerful. Emotive words, right? You don't call it annexation. Annexation has negative connotation. You call it unification. Or reunification is even better. Another example, 2005. In English, we don't call it the anti-separatism law, right? What do we call it? The the anti-succession law. Why? Why succession? Why was it translated that way? Because the United States has that as part of our history. The Civil War. Succession from the Union. So if you talk to any air-breathing American and you say succession, that has a powerful emotional impact on them. Oh, we don't like succession. Secession. If you say splitism, or separatism, or independence, well, we have no problem with splitism, or separatism, and we love independence, right? As we name our, our warships independence this, and then we have, have Independence Day, right? And so how do you translate words? How do you use words to influence people emotionally? Uh, the PLA is very good at that. Chinese propaganda officers are very good at that. And that's something that I don't think we often appreciate, is how good the Chinese can be at manipulating us, at manipulating us, manipulating our emotions. Uh, because this is something that they're doing, and something that they're quite successful at, and something that they'll continue doing. And so going forward, I think we need to, to have these open and canon discussions about these sensitive topics. We need to think about it. We need to, to debate it and to argue it out and to write about it and to talk about it in public. And when false information is out there, then to dispute it, right? So it's debunked. And that's one of the, the, the things that I would suggest for my own government, also for the Taiwanese government, is to spend more time thinking about how we deal with this, this threat of coercion. Because I don't think the Chinese are just about to invade Taiwan. I don't think that's realistic. But I do think that this year and the year after and the year after that, we are going to see this long, drawn-out war of nerves. We're going to see coercive activity after coercive activity after coercive activity, one after the next after the next. And we've seen this now for years, and it's, it's intensifying. And so we need to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, going forward, and so I think that, and I think public education is is part of that. Uh, obviously, government policy is another part of that. Other question? Yeah. I'll try to keep my next okay. few answers shorter. Okay. Excuse me. Maybe we could collect a few. Or you want to give another ten minutes? No. Oh, we, have, we have to give this place to others. Hmm? Well, just that I mean, got you. Okay, maybe another 10 minutes, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'll stay here as long as you guys will. Okay, we have a And I'll keep my answers a lot shorter. I've been droning on. Okay, we have daily, so I'll on. Yes, ma'am. According to our uh, Wall Street Journal today, that uh, the Pentagon is uh, planning for increase of military power in Asia. So what do you think is the implication, the significance of uh, this direction? Can you repeat the question? No. So the significance of the Pentagon increasing military power in Asia? In Asia. In yeah. East Asia. In East Asia. Yeah. To deter, I mean, specifically say deter China and uh, influencing this area. Oh, I think that's very positive. Yeah. I think what that means is that top American policymakers have recognized the threat and they're starting to to deal with it. And hopefully it's not too little too late, right? Because this is something that should have happened 10 years ago. 
but better late than never. And I think when I look at s some of the um, key people in the Trump administration, on the National Security Council, in the Pentagon, and uh, in a couple of key positions at the State Department, while our president may be very controversial <laughs> and makes everybody very uncomfortable, he actually does have a lot of very smart people working for him, a lot of very clear-eyed people on these issues. And so I do think if, if you look at our national security strategy, our national uh, defense strategy, and later this year we'll have the national military strategy come out, I think there's a recognition that we are now in strategic competition with China, and I think that is uh, very, very important for being able to keep peace. So I would take that as a very positive development. Is there any question? I think we are talking about how big and strong the China has become today here, and I think the United States government is hardly to blame, because 10, 20 years ago, we, we have a naive thinking that if we help them economically, their, uh, their political uh, companies you know, it will be softened, and the democracy might be set in in the end. But as today, we see that that's not happening. OK, um, that's about, really my, not my question. That's my comment. My question is, I, I assume you study is uh, mostly done uh, before Trump took the office, right? So do you see any, um, I would say, potential or any meaningful changes to the landscape uh, since Trump took the office, either politically or militarily? On the U.S. side or yeah, on China's US side? side on, on, the, on the situation in general. To the situation in that, in the, over the strait. U.S. From side, yeah. American or from Taiwan or any factor that would affect that situation. Since Trump took the office, Trump's not a Republican. Well, there's several. Yes. Some are positive, some are negative. So on the positive side of the ledger, more people have come into decision-making positions who I think are very smart people on the US side. And of course, I'm very biased, because one of them is my, my boss, former boss, Randy Shriver. Um, so I think that's very positive. On the positive side of the ledger, the US does have this new national security strategy, which seems to be very, very smart. So that's very positive. And we have a, a DPP government in Taipei, which seems to recognize the magnitude of, of the threat. And they're starting to react uh, in ways that are very positive. And they have some very, very bright people at the NSC and elsewhere. So that's very positive. On the negative side, the PLA has rapidly ramped up its coercive activities across from Taiwan. And you all know what they are, so I won't list them all. but. Big ones, bombers circling Taiwan and, and the, the Y-8s collecting intelligence, the aircraft carrier going through the Taiwan Strait, the M503 changing the facts on the ground. There have been so many of these, if you chart them out, in recent months, that they've thrown us into a reactive position. That they have the first mover advantage, and so they're pushing us. And before we can get our feet steady and push back, they push us again. So we fall back a little bit. And then before we can steady, they push us again. And so we're reacting to events instead of shaping events. And so what I worry about is that they're pushing so fast, so quickly, that they're starting to take the initiative away from us. And so I think this is going to be a challenge for Washington, D.C. and for Taipei, is to come up with ways to get the initiative back. So I think that that's you know, these are the, you know, the prospects and the problems that we're looking at. What can we ask them? You're going to ask Co questions? Yes, sir. And the current situation uh, in China. China, the Republic of China and People Republic of China, it's almost impossible to be recognized by the international community. Do you think it's, it'd be easier if we change our name? Taiwan, one China, one Taiwan? Will be easier, of course, difficult from China point of view. But do you think it will be easier in the community, in the international community? 
unfortunately, I don't think anything's easy when, when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, I think self-determination is very important. And from my perspective as an American, you know, the United States, we should not be about trying to keep other democracies from expressing, you know, from exercising self-determination. So that's a roundabout way of saying, I don't know, and I'm not sure it's for an American to say. I think this is for something for the, the citizens, the voters of Taiwan to decide, you know, do you reform the Constitution or not? Are you willing to accept the risk of that or not? Uh, and, but of course, the United States, as, as a close friend and partner, is going to have a vote as well and is going to ex express concerns if, if they're there, and I'd imagine they would be in this particular scenario. I think for the United States, uh, for my own country, the challenge going forward is going to be reconciling our policy with objective reality. Because as you said, and you're 100% right, two Chinas exist, the Republic of China and the People's Republic of China. Two governments exist, the government in Beijing and the government in Taipei. Taiwan's democracy is a reality. And unfortunately, our policy, because we've taken a zero-sum approach, that we must recognize one government or the other, because we bought into that zero-sum approach, and we bought into it so much, that we've gotten ourselves into this position now, since 1996, and especially since the year 2000, where we have this democracy that's a legitimate democracy. We have this country that now we no longer treat as if it's legitimate. We treat Taiwan like a pariah state. And so what we're doing is we're delegitimizing a democracy that shares our values, and we're giving legitimacy to an authoritarian country that's in direct ideological competition with us. And from my perspective, that's a problem. That we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be in that business. And so I, what I would hope is that this administration or any administration that follows it would do a review of our Taiwan policy, that the State Department, that there'd be an interagency review of, of our Taiwan policy. We have not done one since 1992, 1993, 1994, I think it came out. It was the last time they did a Taiwan policy review. And so just to think about, okay, how are the ways in which we can incrementally extend legitimacy to Taiwan, to gradually treat Taiwan like a more normal country, to show that we do respect Taiwan's democracy, and if we can't reestablish diplomatic relations uh, in the foreseeable future, at least we can start to, to piece by piece, step by step, normalize that, that relationship. Because I would hate to be, I would hate to come to the year 2049, you know, and retire, because by then I'll be about ready to retire, and to, be, to live in a world in which the United States government still recognizes the PRC, still treats the communist regime as if it's legitimate, and as if it's essential to everything, and that we still treat a democracy like it doesn't exist like it's a rogue. I would hope that by the year 2049, we would have normal diplomatic relations with both Taipei and Beijing, that we'd have an embassy in both Taipei and in Beijing, and by then, that China would be a democracy that respects self-determination, so it wouldn't be so much of a problem in the first place, right? That, that's, that's the hope, that's the hope. Okay. But it's just a hope right now. We have closing remarks from then. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you uh, After President Tsai Ing-wen took the office, right after he, she took the office, she made a visit to a country in uh, Central America. On the way back, she stopped over in Los Angeles. I believe all of us went to welcome her in the banquet, right? At that moment, something happened in the Taiwan Strait. Zhongshan Kershaw and Zhou Yen, the misfire and missile, hit one of the fishing boats. Remember? Everybody remember that yeah. instance? It was so precise. 
very precise, stunned, quite a few experts in PRC. They was amazed how can that missile get so, so precise. I think uh, Jack just mentioned Taiwan does have the first react strike capability and was recognized as a PR, PRC. And uh, if you look at Taiwan's schedule, public schedule, about one third of her schedule visit appeared in public is with the military. <coughs> Just look at that. So she, I believe, I'm not talking, maybe talk to her, but from my observation, she's determined to build the defense and offense capability to make Taiwan like a Pokemon. If you want to swallow me, you have to pay the price. But that, I believe that she, what she is doing right now. Unfortunately, I think conclusion of this kind of talk, we feel that a lot of militaries in the existing military, they, they waste so much interest in the existing system, there's a lot of resistance in the current system, which may make her uh, strategy not be able to carry out. So we, because we live so far away, we are very objective and not involved in the internal project. I encourage everyone, if you're interested in studying this, and at the right time, give them some a very objective advice. When they need our support, we support them. When they are doing something uh, not in conjunction with Defend Taiwan, mm -hmm. we have to voice up too. So, I think all of you have seen two hours, which is a good indication that in Los Angeles we see a lot of uh, Taiwanese Americans really care about Taiwan, care about the security of uh, interest of the United States. I thank you, and I thank you, I thank everybody for this kind of compliment. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you.